Good afternoon, a very warm welcome back here. I hope you're all full of energy, high vibes only for the rest of the day. And we will start this afternoon with some heavy food, but we can't and we won't skip the topic. Since two years, almost by now, there's war in Europe and the things have changed and the answers we give as Europeans, but also as the members of the EU, are different. Germany, for example, always refers to the United States. Have a look there and then move. Switzerland claims, as often, as always, neutrality. And even after Brexit, there's one country, Great Britain, that decides to take a leading role, a leading position, and be a partner for Ukraine. Near Odessa, there's a street called Boris Johnson. This is, <laughs> it's uh, not because the Ukrainians like Boris Johnson so much, but he was one of the very first leaders visiting Kiev and just said, hey, we are there. We won't discuss, we deliver weapons, we are next to you. You matter. So we thought this afternoon we should talk to a British gentleman and get to know and listen to our role and our responsibilities in this conflict. So please, give a warm welcome and an applause to General Sir Richard Barons. Well, what a room. I've sat in here for uh, two days. Uh, you've done something to German. That wasn't the German I did at school, by the way, so it was a lot of it entirely passed me by. <laughs> but, but energy, intellect, strong moral compass, ambition, get all of that, maybe a little whiff of entitlement every now and again. <laughs> but you're all nice people. And, and, and that makes me the odd one out. I, I make no pretense at being a nice person. My whole life has been about professional violence, from a little bijou counterterrorism to fermenting industrial scale violence and destruction. I'm the guy that works out how to invade countries, protect my own, and do all the other things that are in the middle. My ob objective today is to make you think about the war in Ukraine and make you think about war and its role in the rest of your lives. And if I move half of you, I will count today as successful. I'm going to start with two statements. The first is, the war in Ukraine is a symptom of the strategic confrontation that now exists between us in the West and uh, Russia. We didn't choose it but we've got it. And winning is as vital for everybody in this room as it is for the young man or woman who froze last night in a hole three meters under the ground in Ukraine. And why might that be? Well, that is because Russia decided to invade a democratic country on the fringes of the European Union against its wishes to extinguish it as a state, to make it part of a return to a greater Russian imperial empire, and to do so knowing that we wouldn't be thrilled. It also is the same country that thinks it's fine to run some of the strongest organized crime gangs in the world at your businesses and your lives, including astonishing cyber capability, and to interfere in our elections. Now, if you're okay with that, I'm in the wrong room, but if you're okay with that, then the war in Ukraine is just about Ukraine. If you're not okay with that, then this war and its outcome matters to you. But even if we were just to have a conversation with Ukraine, I would fall short today, because we need to talk about the new era of existential risk of which this war uh, which Russia has inflicted on Ukraine and us is a symptom. And this, I hope, is pretty familiar to most of you. 
for the rest of your lives, whether you're, whether you're one of the younger in the room or one of the more senior, your world will be dominated by the confluence and the combination of these four factors. The, the, rise of, the rise of China, shorthand for the return to great power confrontation in our world. Another shorthand, a clash between liberal democracy, us, and autocratic capitalist China with Russia as a sort of footnote. And a lot of the world looking on and wondering who to back if they need to back anybody. It's not obvious to them that it's you, by the way. But we've had great power confrontation in our world before, but never had to do it at a time when our planet can no longer sustain our abuse and expectations and demands of it, particularly as we impose on it a population that will reach around 8 billion by 20, 2050. The instability of climate change, the fact that we know now that we are going to have to accommodate the effects that we have failed to see off, will provide the tableau on which great power confrontation will play out. It will affect all of us and hundreds of millions of people and their lives and their expectations. And while we're doing those two things, we will have to manage the effect of the digital revolution, a subject that's come up uh, extremely well today. As you know, the digital age is transforming how we live, how we work, how we play, and of course it's going to change how we fight. We'll return to that theme. The innovation that is in the heads of some of you in this room is the key to the way we transform how we fight, which is how we'll secure ourselves. And then there's the fourth thing. We don't like to talk about nuclear weapons, but since the end of the Cold War, more people are getting nuclear weapons, more people want them. But the thing that's changed, and you've seen this both in Ukraine and in Gaza, is that some people think it's okay to use a small one. And by small, I mean 15 kiloton. That's quite small. And the fact is, it's not OK, but, the, but it will not necessarily lead to superpower escalation and the end of life on, the, on this planet. But those four things. So let's look at a couple of statements again. The first is, most of you, particularly the more senior in the room, you have led your adult lives with this sense that Europe had gone post-conflict. We don't need war anymore. It, 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 we just decided we were through it. And that somehow we in Europe, and we have a comfortable life, we, we were guaranteed to uh, increase our prosperity in conditions of great comfort and security. Uh, and the world would eventually bend to our way, the inevitable triumph of liberal democracy and market economies. That has all gone. In my mind, if you want a mouse, and it went when Russia invaded Crimea in 2014. China does not mean the world to work in the way that you would like it to work and we're having a conversation. You also generally think of yourselves as post-conflict. World War II ended in the last century. Actually, if you look at the, at the nexus of risk I just set out for you, it is much more likely that you are now pre-conflict. That's not necessarily about fighting for the territorial integrity of Europe, though Russia, if it could, would make it so. It's much more about protecting your interests for your security, your prosperity, and your values when something like climate change provokes enormous instability and crisis somewhere in a planet which affects directly our lives here. If you think of yourselves as pre-conflict, you're going to take a very different view to how you think about the subject of, of war. There is no immunity in this. Now, uh, I understand I'm in Switzerland, Swilson declares neutrality, but in the world I've described, neutrality is not the same as immunity. And for those of us that reach into uh, collective security arrangements, more of which in a minute, we will find that we look after ourselves. We are not necessarily overly generous to those that sit outside the club. Ask Ukraine. And that means if we're going to have a conversation about war and conflict, we need to talk about war. Now, this is on your TV screens there. I normally, with an audience, I have to explain about the nature of war. The nature of war is an aspect of the human condition unchanging over the centuries. It is brutal. It is feral. It is irrational. It's disappointing. It's dangerous. It's destructive. 
It's generally not very successful. But some always find it liberating and glamorous when they haven't experienced it and are tempted by it. It seems to be a cyclical thing. Basic fact is, give someone like me the tools, missiles, cyber, proxies, and a shipload of ammunition, and I, and I will reduce the lovely civilization of any of your countries in about two weeks. The power will go off, the water will go away, your welfare systems will collapse, your food supply will collapse, I will make it so. That is war in the raw. And if you want the most graphic example in my whole life, it's in Gaza now. That is war in the raw. You may think you don't want that, you'd be right. You may think you're immune to it in Europe, you'd be wrong. So the nature of war never changes, but the character of war, how it's fought, changes all the time. Of course it does. Circumstances, events, technology, and thinking. And so what might we learn from Ukraine? Well, the first is war, big wars, are fought, won, and lost by you, not me. I'm the professional military. I start the thing off, and then usually I'm wiped out, to be honest. But if you look at what's happening in Ukraine on both sides of the line, the line is manned by you, by people who two years ago had lives like you and expected to have lives like you. So war is about mobilizing civil society and industry. It's a contest of will and capacity and endurance. That is not, frankly, what is featured in most of your adult lives. For example, I spent a lot of time in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Bosnia, where you send professional militaries away to do discretionary interventions. That era has now passed. Secondly, you're used to talking about the effects of climate change and how you need to be resilient to it, whether it's here or anywhere, anywhere at home. You now need to think about how you are resilient to people who choose to confront you and may occasionally conflict with you. We'll return to that. Thirdly, war is more than weapons. A lot of conversation about artillery, ammunition, and all that kind of thing. But war is about will and industry and people and training and food, and communication, it's about innovation. So that's another aspect of how war becomes a whole of society uh, effort. And then the fact is, ask Ukraine, that in this world that we now live in, no European country, no matter how big or small, is going to survive and thrive unless they invest in collective security. Arguably, even the US and China need friends. And we have two vehicles here in, in Europe. We have NATO, celebrates its 75th anniversary next year, the most successful military alliance ever, although for the last 30 years, frankly, it's, it's been able to be asleep. It's now uh, waking up. NATO is about hard power. And Article 5 applies if you're a member of NATO. Ask Ukraine. The European Union, all about soft power, unique in power blocks in the world is that it chooses not to align political power and military power with its economic strength. Maybe that worked for a while. I don't think that works in the future. Because, actually, when we talk about war, there are three constituent things, and they're all integrated, that you have to be good at. You have to be resilient. And there are four parts to resilience. The first is simple physical resilience. Things like infrastructure and port operations and food supply, it has, it has to work. And you have to protect it because people like me know to take it away from you. There's a human dimension, got to keep people safe. That's about hospitals and evacuation and shelters if necessary and drills. That's not hard. I don't think anybody in Europe does that anymore. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. There is a digital element to resilience. We, everything we do depends on digital architecture in some way or another. My job is to take that away from you so your phone doesn't function, your industrial control systems don't function, your transport networks don't function, and of course your air defense doesn't work. But the fourth bit of resilience is the most thing, most importantly, it's, it's your head. It's cognitive resilience. And for the first time ever in the history of mankind, people like me can make war directly into your head thanks to the phone that you carry. I can tailor a message, I can freak you out, I can inspire you, I can break you. 
but it's the resilience in your head in this world I'm describing to you that is often the decisive factor. And then there's the bit in the middle. War and confrontation is often about not military stuff. This is hybrid or grace based or tolerance uh, warfare. It's about assuming, assembling all the levers of power short of the use of military force. Some of that is in the public sector, the things governments do, money, ministers making phone calls, development aid, that kind of thing. By far, the greatest power of Europe in hybrid confrontation is in the private sector. It's about banking and, and law and culture and sport and entertainment and manufacturing and innovation. And most of you are connected to that. Those are the things that make Europe powerful uh, in commerce, in confrontation, and in conflict. And then there is this bit about, of course, the digital age is changing how we have armies, navies, and air forces. This is the most significant transformation for 150 years in how you do military stuff. It's about cloud, and AI, and robotics, and autonomy, and bioscience, and networks, and autonomy. There's a very dark side to this. But if you could harness the innovation in this room and in Europe, we would find better, a more effective, cheaper, more sustainably affordable, and exportable ways of resecuring uh, Europe because we would be on the front edge of this digital transformation. Even if, as was described this morning, quite a lot of the base technology is in the US, the fact is a lot of the innovative thought uh, is here. And, and this is a competition because if, I, if you were a Chinese audience or a Russian audience, I would be saying the same thing. But, as a choice. So let's circle back round. So the war in Ukraine is about your interests and your security. And let's come down to the issue of the day here where you get to make a choice. And that is, right now, there are Ukrainian soldiers sitting in trenches, and they'll be there all winter, with not enough ammunition or equipment or training. There's nothing on their shelf. There's nothing left on our shelves. We've given all the stuff that we kept in store. The only way Ukraine wins is if we now mobilize our industry and our will behind that. And do not tell me it's unaffordable because you represent an economy of 15 trillion euros a year and I can feed the Ukrainian military on about 75 billion euros a year for two or three years and I can make them win. This is not about affordability. This is about choice and competence. And isn't it a bargain if we can defeat Russia's objections to you on a war in Ukraine where you only spend money you do not spend your children? Bargain of the century. And then it's going to take us to this, and this is where I'd like to leave you. If, you have, if there's a dinner party question for the rest uh, of this week, it's this. So we talk about war in Ukraine, we talk about the business of war, we talk about existential risk, and all of you in this room are leaders. But actually, if you think about it, if you extend what I'm saying to you, you are leading humanity when humanity may sit on the edge of extinction for these reasons. First of all, we've always fought for things that only exist in our heads, religions, political philosophies, name it. We believe these things we invent to be true, to be eternal, to be universal, and to be exclusive. We fight with people over their choice of headwear, many other things. That, that's been true forever, it's true now. But what's different is, we're now beginning to fight with weapons in the digital age. We've always had nuclear weapons, but now with artificial intelligence, we're going to start to create weapons that we don't fully understand, we may not necessarily control, but they could take control and wipe us out. And when we do that, we'll be doing it on a collapsing planet that can't tolerate our abuse and expectations, and we can no longer fix problems by moving in a world of 8 billion people or consuming stuff we've dug out of the ground and throwing it away in the way we fixed our problems for millennia. That doesn't work anymore. And in the middle of that dilemma of we fight to the death for the things that we invent with weapons we don't understand that could destroy us on a planet that's giving up on us, is us. And maybe we forget we're animals. 
that everyone in this room shares 98% of their DNA with the chimpanzee and the bonobo, and the 2% is what has created all, all of this. The 2% split the atom, gave us the internet, and then stuffed it with cat videos and pornography. It's a mixed <laughs> blessing. And the 2% allows us to be brilliant but also flawed, but we need to remember the 98% Hmm, we're not very good at being generous. We're not very good at being tolerant. We're not very good at sacrificing consumption now for warding off putative future peril. And we much prefer, if sacrifices are to be made, that somebody else we don't know somewhere else in the world should make it. If you bundle all of that together, ask yourself, 100 years from now, Will there still be a Lucerne dialogue, or will there be left the smoking ruins of an earth that's run by the, at, the ants and the rats? Because we, Homo sapiens, we were not up to that. I think it's a 50-50 bet. Now, you may choose to ignore me, but choosing not to choose, choosing not to decide, choosing not to act is a decision of itself, and I can't put it better than that. Franco, thank you very much. Well, quite alarming, <laughs> this speech, but uh, you asked the question, what's our role in this war? So given the fact that the Europeans giving different answers to that conflict, would you say neutrality is a role, is a position that you can choose, or do you say that's off the menu due to the different circumstances today? So I think in the world in which we live in, um, Every nation will have to find a, a, a collective response, join with others, in order to decide how the world's going to work and to ward off those that disagree with us and may assert that disagreement uh, with us. For, for most countries, that's about collective security. And it works well because um, you, you make sacrifice. Someone described them, you put a little bit of sovereignty in a bucket in the, in the Ukraine, and everyone benefits, although, frankly, it's a bit, it, it's a bit, um, uh, a bit uncomfortable from, from time to time. The, the, the problem with declaring um, neutrality uh, is that you, you need everyone else to leave you alone, as well as perhaps take advantage of neutrality. And in a world of existential peril, the peril doesn't really respect any borders, not, not cyber, not food chains, not supply, anything like that. So the peril may come to you, and then you have no friends. And um, the, the British in Brexit were accused of being cakeist, that we wanted to be in the European Union without actually having to pay any price for it, have your cake and eat it. To some degree, in a world of peril, there is a danger that being neutral, which I respect and has many advantages, may turn out to be a cakeist approach that fails. So Finland and Sweden, both countries just decided to join NATO. Yeah. They didn't join Europe because Europe isn't even able to defend itself, at least until now. So uh, do you believe that NATO is the alliance for the future, the stronger hmm. alliance compared to the European partners? So uh, as I say, NATO is 75 years old. It's sustained by, by the US taxpayer. Uh, European defense budget is about a trillion euros a year. About 850 of that trillion is American. And the US taxpayer has now decided that they have other things to worry about, which is China, but also that when it looks at the European offer to itself, our welfare, our health, our education, we, we have built a lovely world for ourselves because we've not spent several hundred billion euros a year on our defense. The American taxpayer has obliged us. And they're thinking they're distracted, they're deep in debt, they don't want to do that, and should Mr. Trump appear, they definitely not want to do that. Uh, and, and so this um, NATO organization, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a superb military alliance, but Europe is going to have to carry its end of the log. Or, or, or we should close it down and do something else. But the US is not going to carry NATO in the way that it has, frankly, for my entire life. You already mentioned Mr. Trump. He announced already if he would become president next year again, president-elected, 
24 hours and the war would, be, would end. First of all, do you think there is a chance <laughs> <laughs> that this uh, becomes true? And the second thing, how would a NATO look like if Donald Trump becomes president again? So, uh, so it's a very difficult thing to do in 20, 24 hours. Mr. Putin believes that if he holds on in Ukraine just by being stubborn, you don't have to take much territory, Mr. Trump will walk away from Ukraine and then we, Europe, we, we won't have the bottle for it. We, we have the money, I've, I've said that. We can absolutely afford it, but we'll walk away without the US paying the price uh, that it pays. So that's the, uh, the Russian strategy. If that happens, well, two things. One is we'll have to have our own conversation about how we then service the needs of Ukraine. I think there's only one answer on that. And then we're going to have to understand that it was great for about three quarters of a century having our security underwritten by the US, but also it's ended. And if we, 500 million people, and I'm going to throw the UK back into Europe at this point, 500 million people, if we want a voice in a difficult world, if we want our interests to be recognized and if we want to protect them, then we'll have to rebuild that. And it's an expensive, um, but, but it's something that we are perfectly capable of doing. It's just going to cost us a lot more money. Another pain for Europe these days is Mr. Orban in Hungary. Um, he always talks to Putin again. He also sticks, uh, chooses his side. So how to handle Orban? Would you say he needs to leave the EU? Or is this kind of end of dialogue and that's, that's the wrong way? So, uh, so in my bones, I'm still a soldier. And I therefore struggle a bit with politics. Um, but, and, and therefore, my view can be simplistic, which is um, the more the chips are down, the more you need to know who your friends are. Uh, and, and who's on your side and who isn't on your side. Um, and slightly resentful of, of people who may seek your protection but not cooperate with your, uh, your, your, your wider policies and, and outcomes. I don't think we're anywhere near that point in Europe yet. I don't think this conflict um, in, in Ukraine has deepened to that extent. But if there are countries in Europe that, that wish to subscribe to a Russian way of life, then, then that is to my mind, incompatible with how many of us would prefer to do. Maybe we come to a parting of the ways. I think we're a long way short of that now. Poly crisis, you already mentioned Gaza, seems to be the normal, the new normal. But at the same time, societies are getting tired of it. You can see that also <laughs> in the consumption of news. And mm. this is the same in the entire European room. So how to get society aware of it, but don't lose them for example, to the right-wing parties all over Europe? Mm. So um, I, I think it's a very natural thing that when terrible things happen, such as we're seeing in, in Gaza and indeed in Ukraine, based on, our, on the lived experience of most of us in this room, we want to think of it as a blip, that this is an unfortunate thing that happened. It will be managed and life will reset itself. But actually, the dynamics of the world I've described this afternoon are really not like that. Um, we are re returning to um, existential peril where if we choose not to identify, uh, stand up for, and, art and articulate, and if necessary, defend our interests, um, we'll become the, the victims in waiting in the 21st century. I think there's an enormous part here in education and, and probably training amongst political leaders and officials and military officers and civil society where... Um, it's, this isn't obvious to people. And surely it would be better that, that an audience like this particularly, we were good enough to identify the peril which we have done, to work out what you need to do in order to manage that peril, which we do, but, but then we elect not to do it. And the example of Ukraine is a, is a small but important example there. Way better to be good enough homo sapiens to identify the problem, work out what to do, then actually do it and... and, and deter the harm from happening than our normal habit, which is to say that's terrible but expensive and not happened yet, and wait for it to slap you in the face before you do anything about it, though that is our historical habit. Mr. Barons, I would love to continue. No, we would love to continue, <laughs> I guess, but you have to catch your train, unfortunately. I, I hope to see you again, and thank you so much for you. all your information. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>